Hello, everybody. Um, so we're going to be sh presenting today OpenStack scale and performance testing with Browbeat. We're going to be taking the wizardry out of OpenStack performance. So first off, um, my name is Alex Cross. Um, you can find me on IRC as Akerzos, and I work for Red Hat. I'm okay. I'm Saison Malini. I work on the Red Hat performance engineering team. And I'm Will Foster. I work on the performance and scale team as well, more on the DevOps infrastructure side. So here's our agenda. We're going to be giving an overview of Browbeat. We're going to have uh, Will's going to talk about the infrastructure. I'm going to be talking about the metrics collection and analysis. Um, Sai is going to be discussing the results collection analysis. Uh, Sai and I will go into some of the performance and scale issues that we've found uh, using Browbeat. We're going to talk the future of Browbeat. Uh, we have a slide on uh, how you can help contribute, how you can get involved with us. Uh, if there's any time, we're going to take Q&A. Uh, if not, we'll be available outside the, uh, the hall there. All right, so Browbeat overview. Probably wondering, what is OpenStack Browbeat? Well, it's a number of other open source projects all combined into a performance and scale analysis uh, orchestration tool. So you probably see a lot of uh, familiar, uh, familiar terms there, or uh, projects like Rally, Elasticsearch, PerfKit Benchmarker, Grafana, Collecti, Graphite. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about uh, everything that we do is we, anything that we find like a problem in any of this software, we'll open an issue or we'll uh, we'll follow up, we'll try to commit a patch in or try to help them enhance that software as well as we're using it. So the true spirit of open source there. So uh, all right. All right. Um try to plug this back in. Having a little technical difficulties here. Um, this thing not. Anybody know any good jokes? How we? Uh... Yeah. So. I'm gonna plug it in there. So, uh, what is OpenStack Browbeat? Um, it's not a new workload. It's not just a new way to gather metrics. Um, it is an orchestration tool. Um, we have a nice diagram up here. Hopefully, it'll, it'll show. It's really good. I would love that you're able to see it. You just got to take our word for it right yeah. now. But, uh, but uh, it, it's a way to, uh, we can install, every, the way, we typically work with uh, triple O clouds. So we have an under cloud and an over cloud. And we install Browbeat on the undercloud. And from there, we kind of launch, we orchestrate all of our testing. Um, we can do the installation of all the tooling, uh, such as Collecti. Uh, it'll feed metrics over to uh, the Graphite Carbon server. Um, and then the metrics will be available at, uh, for viewing through Grafana. Um, and then all of our data plane benchmarks, they obviously run instance to instance above your computes. Uh, control plane benchmarks, those will run from your Browbeat uh, installation against your controllers. Uh, we collect metadata on the controllers and the computes. That way we can, we can combine the metadata with the results data, and we can, uh, we can then push that to Elasticsearch. Sorry. OK, I'm just going to talk through why Browbeat matters, because there's already so many tools out there, and what is new about it, or what is it helping you do? So OpenStack has matured quite a bit over the years in terms of functionality, right? So more of the concerns that enterprises have are around performance and scale. And I can't go to the next point, because I don't see anything here. OK. So the other thought is performance and scale should operate and integrate like CI, with OpenStack releases coming about every six months or so. You don't want to wait for a re release and you know, a bunch of performance engineers sit down and try to benchmark it. It should be more like CI, like how you push code and it tells you if it fails or it passed. 
So your performance also should operate like CI, your performance benchmarking. And also customers and partners have a lot of questions around, you know, how many routers can I get on this environment? How many tenants can I get on this environment? So it's not possible for any one of us to answer every single question that a customer or a partner has because each environment is different and that model is never going to scale. If you want to be able to scale, you're going to be able to empower your customers or partners with the tools they need to you know, be able to benchmark their cloud, tune their cloud, and whatnot. So there's a lot of good tools upstream. There's Rally, this, which is good at control plane. There's Shaker, which is good at uh, data plane. There's all these results collection and analysis tools. So they're, they're good tools, but they're good at what they do. So we're trying to fill in the gaps here. So you, you take a bunch of new uh, upstream tools, and you fill in the missing gaps, and you give the end user an experience where he just fires two or three commands, and everything flows from there. And you can also compare and tune your cloud for the best performance. So that's how Browbeat matters. And the workload, so we have a simple YAML-based config file. So first thing is Rally, which is the most popular in terms of benchmarking. So we have Keystone, Nova, Neutron, and other scenarios. We also have some custom plugins we built into it. And the pbench plugin scenarios are special in the sense that pbench is uh, uh, is what we're working on at Red Hat internally, and we've open sourced it. What it lets you do is pretty much benchmark anything, VM or bare metal, it doesn't care. As long as you can SSH into it, you can run performance benchmarks on it. So we have pbench also integrated with Rally. So Rally stands up the infrastructure and kicks off pbench. So that's pretty neat there. And we have Shaker, so it does throughput, latency, TCP, UDP. Uh, let's you spin up a topology, whatever you want, L2, L3, East, West, North, South. So, and it also does a beautiful job of orchestrating several pairs of VMs uh, firing bandwidth concurrently. And we have PerfKit Benchmarker, which is, a, which is itself a, a combination of different workloads. It's got, it's got 30 or so workloads in it. And the cool thing about PerfKit Benchmarker is it actually lets you measure cloud elasticity. It keeps a track of how much time it took to spin up your resources, clean up the cloud, and things like that. So it's pretty cool. So zero to performance testing. There's hardly like 10 steps on this slide, but most of them you can actually neglect because they're changing directories and editing configuration files. So you can pretty much get to zero to performance testing in these 10 steps. So you set up Browbeat. You edit an Ansible-based uh, uh, WASH file that uh, tells where your Elasticsearch instance is sitting at, where's your Graphite, where's your Grafana. Then you set up your monitoring. That's also very simple. You just run a couple of playbooks. It installs CollectD across the nodes and also uploads the dashboards to Grafana. And then you jump right into performance testing. So you edit a config file, which is having all these uh, workloads in it. You enable what you want and disable what you don't want, and you just jump right into the workloads. So I'll hand it over to Will. All right, thanks, Sai. So with Browbeat, there's a lot of complex components to OpenStack. So our goal around Browbeat was to keep things as simple as possible and as repeatable as possible. So when you look at the workflow of Browbeat, it's very simple. There's just about, there's about four major categories. Um, and it just lets you run Browbeat over and over until you get the, the uh, results that you're after. But again, we're kind of aiming for simplicity here. Um, when we dive into some of the infrastructure tools as well, you'll see that everything is automated in a way that requires very minimal input, very minimal post configuration, if at all, uh, when things get set up. All right, uh, this is probably the most, okay, please behave. Um, I think we should this is probably the most exciting part of Browbeat for me. Um, it is groundbreaking in that uh, it can, <laughs> okay, you have to take my word for this. The stuff on this slide is really, really cool. Um, so Browbeat will not only just do performance testing, it also has an optional ability to go through and scan your cloud for known CVEs, known vulnerabilities, um, things around like uh, performance testing, uh, tuning values that might not be optimal. So it does a lot more than just um, run Rally, run Perf, um, run uh, Shaker and all the other various tools that kind of comprise it. It actually will um, give you a, a spit out of any bugs that you might be hitting, any performance recommendations. And it kind of fits in line with performance and scale being more uh, CI driven and less kind of the, the legacy way that people would do performance and scale testing where, you know, heaven forbid, you might shove your data in a spreadsheet somewhere. Or, you know, if you're lucky, you could 
write a white paper that no one reads after a year. Um, this is more uh, involved, uh, and you actually get some very useful details right away as far as how optimal your cloud is set up, um, any performance tunings that you could benefit from and, and things like that. So um, in a way, this is kind of like, it's kind of like CI for performance and scale. Uh, I know that the upstream infrastructure folks are also looking to browbeat to do um, post-validation. So after a new deployment rolls out, um, they'll run through the browbeat test, and then it should at least hit a minimal threshold of acceptable performance before it's deemed to be usable uh, by the general public. Okay, so I'm going to dump into some of the playbooks that we ship with browbeat, and these are, these are optional. You don't have to install them, uh, but we needed a way to um, very quickly spin up ancillary infrastructure uh, via the Elk stack, Grafana, Graphite, kind of some of the bread and butter tools that we use to visualize metrics and performance data. So um, we ship two different playbooks. Uh, we ship an entire Elk stack. You have the option of using Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and Kibana, or you can use FluentD as well. And we also ship Graphite and Grafana um, with an optional ability to ship it through a Docker container if you are a Docker shop and you like those better. So kind of diving into some of the ELK uh, components. Um, this is, again, optional and it's extremely simple. One Ansible command, you have a fully working all-in-one ELK stack. Um, you also set up the clients for that as well. Um, we opt to use FileBeat for the clients, uh, but you can switch that out with FluentD if you like. And some of the highlights of the ELK stack, and, and we've kind of made some decisions for you. We want to keep things as simple as possible but we're, we're oriented towards things like um, if you're running performance tests at a customer site or you're, you're running at a partner site and you might not have access to a proper FQDN or um, you, know, you wanna have one siloed place to keep your data then pull out later. Um, so a lot of these decisions are made around uh, what works best for us from a testing perspective. You could take this ELK stack and use it in your infrastructure for system logs or anything else, but some of the options that we chose um, everything is encrypted by SSL by default. Um, some of this traffic may go over the WAN, so it's, it's good that you have encryption. Um, the certs are generated during the Ansible playbook run. So we also add in alt sans support. So what that will give you is if you don't have access to have a proper reverse and forward DNS name, you can use IP address. And a lot of small siloed testing setups, you may not have the liberty of being able to spin up proper DNS and you could cause issues in, unless you go in there and, and actually create the search yourself. So that's taken care of. Uh, another cool thing is that we don't make any decisions about or try to make any decisions about what your infrastructure looks like. Everyone's setup is different. Uh, so we set up IP tables rules for you. It, we first detect if you're using firewall D or IP tables or nothing at all, and then we drop the proper rule, and then we make it persistent, but we, we don't clobber your existing rule sets. So we don't want to try to make any assumptions about anyone else's infrastructure. Um, we also do automatic heap size tuning with Elasticsearch. So we will take half of your system memory up to 32 gigs, or, um, and so the rest can go to Lucene indexes. So there's just kind of little best practice things that, that we've baked in there for you that you don't need to worry about. Um, we'll optionally install the curator tool as well, and we have some Kibana dashboards that we ship uh, that's optional. And again, everything's configurable in, in YAML files. Same sort of thing with Graphite and Grafana. Um, just, just one Ansible playbook. It'll set you up. Everything's automated. So if you're curious, you can look at uh, the GitHub there and take a look. And again, some cool stuff with Graphite and Grafana. Everything's automated. The database creation, the user creation. Um, we really just want to simplify very quickly setting up ancillary infrastructure for you to either host your test results or to have something longer running to, to benefit you, save you time. All right, uh, I'll be talking about metrics collection and storage analysis. So we use a collect -E carbon, graphite, grafana stack to uh, collect our metrics, store the metrics, and visualize the metrics. collect -E is a lightweight daemon. That's what we use to push metrics out of our systems. Carbon will then receive it and write it into Whisper database files. Grafana is the really pretty part that everybody likes to see, so we're going to kind of jump right over into that. Uh, with Browbeat, we ship with a number of dashboards because uh, if you ever use Grafana, you know that you've got to configure it yourself, and there's a lot to learn there and figure out, especially when you're dealing with metrics for the first time. 
So we include static dashboards, cloud-specific dashboards, and generic generated dashboards. This is an example of the static dashboard. What we can do here is we can actually compare uh, two different clouds, two different nodes from the clouds, or you can do the same cloud, the same node, and then compare disks, interfaces, different process metrics there. So you can see we compare uh, CPU and uh, memory right there. So cloud-specific dashboards are really to help you visualize what's going on with your controllers, your computes, and your under cloud. And we'll do this by visualizing everything on the same single pane of glass, your CPU, memory, disks, or, and network. So here's an example of the CPU one. You can see the top graph is actually the under cloud, and then the, uh, the next three graphs below it are our three controllers. And that's a set of 96 keystone benchmarks orchestrated through Browbeat, run from, from Rally. So here's what the memory looks like. I just wanted to provide uh, a, a view of what the memory would look like using these dashboards as well. Here's what your disk utilization would look like. We actually ship uh, several main chunks of this dashboard here. So you have the percent utilization of your disk. So you can very quickly see if you've saturated your disks or not, which if you're working with older hardware or older disks, you'll saturate them real fast. And you want to know because your benchmarks are going to perform horribly. Um, we also have IOPS and throughput as well. And for network, we do packets per second and throughput. And you could also select, with Grafana, you can always select what interface. And this selects it for whichever node type you want. So this visualization right here, you can see how traffic is leaving the undercloud and going towards uh, overcloud controller one. Our generated dashboards are specific to the undercloud controller, compute, Ceph. They're basically, uh, we take a lot of Ansible YAML and we generate a large chunk of the dashboard. So let's see here. Uh, you can see we have a number of rows that we have of different metrics that we have pre-baked, uh, pre pre-visualized right in there. You just have to expand the row out. Obviously, if I expanded all these out, I would need a humongous screen. Um, and there's a, just a number of things that we collect and graph here. Also, with the, uh, the cloud-specific dashboards, you can see that we'll tag um, a dashboard and we'll tag your CPU, disk, memory, network all in one, all in one uh, tag there. So then you can use the tagging port to, uh, to, to select which dashboard you want to view. So here's what some of the per-process metrics look like. Uh, going off those same 96 benchmarks here, we can see what the utilization is off of uh, Apache, as well as um, there's you know, Keystone, Neutron, and Nova. So those 96 Keystone, Keystone benchmarks that we ran was authenticating key with the Keystone Python client, then authenticating with the Neutron client, and then the Nova client. So you can see exactly when those benchmarks ran and how much CPU is being used for those specific processes. Now, it is an aggregation over all of the workers, so do remember that part. You're not going to get down to the very specific process there unless it has a process title that we can separate on. Here is a view of what uh, process and thread counts look like. And this is a, uh, what's interesting here to point out is the same set of benchmarks, but you can look at the threads of MySQL and you can see how each, we go through the first set of Keystone benchmarks and the threads is a certain level. And then once we hit Neutron, the threads grows a whole bunch. And then um, you can see this giant drop here. That's some threads timing out at that point, And it's staying at a certain level with the Nova validation benchmark. This is the, the plugin we use with MySQL. So we'll gather a lot of MySQL metrics as well, including the threads, the number of threads that are connected, the traffic that's going on. Another very interesting way or thing tooling that we can use is how quickly we can find out if we've, we've hit the brick wall, because it's, no, uh, it's really no fun at all to try to evaluate performance after you hit the brick wall. You're not going to get numbers that make sense, and you're going to waste a lot of time debugging. So uh, we use the tail plugin to look for error messages. So whenever I start to see error messages, I know at that point I've got to discount the rest of the benchmark. All right, side. OK, I don't want to stand here and mess with the wire. OK, so. <clears throat> results collection and analysis. So for the longest time ever, performance engineers have been using spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are great. They're awesome. But you know, what if you get to a point where the overhead of managing your spreadsheets is much more than the effort it takes you to generate your results or your performance benchmarks? So this is going to be the underlying theme of uh, 
the next part of this presentation. So, so making results meaningful. What do I mean when I say making results meaningful? So what if I had a data store where I could store my benchmark data, my performance results, possibly perpetually? What if, it, what if I could easily query and search it? What if I could aggregate it, do all kinds of statistical analysis on it? And I could also easily slice and dice data so I can visualize whatever I've collected until now. And because this so-called data store is perpetual, I'll be able to plot historic trends and whatnot. So basically what I'm trying to uh, do is get more value out of my performance benchmarks or, or my performance testing data. So letting JSON craft results. So each of these workloads we've talked about, Rally, Shaker, and PerfKit Benchmarker, they output JSONs. But we got to keep in mind that th these JSONs were not built with the idea in mind that they were going to be ingested into Elasticsearch. For sure, they're ingestible into Elasticsearch because they're JSONs. But to be able to get the same kind of value out of data like you see here, it's create and list routers, which each atomic action displayed in a different color, like creating a network, creating a subnet. And each of those sets of bars is corresponding to a different count of neutron API workers. So to be able to slice and dice data like this, the native JSON that is outputted is not, needs to be massaged and needs to be worked on. And we'll go into more details later. in a hurry. OK, so just talking about the high-level tools we use here, Ansible. Most of you know Ansible, so it's simple ID configuration and automation. Elasticsearch, so this is like, you know, simply put, it's a search engine. So you could put data into it, and you can search, and you can query. Anything that's a JSON document, it can be a, an object in Elasticsearch. And Kibana, it's more like the interface into Elasticsearch. So you can query, you can visualize data. You can give shape to your data using Kibana. OK. These tools are really important, so we're going to focus on it for just a little while over there. there. OK, so still doesn't change. Just, just keep breathing. Just keep going. OK, so just trying to put it all together, which is the next slide. It's got an awesome graphic, but unfortunately, nothing works today. So, so you kick off Brabeat, and there's this config file where you tell it you know, whether you want Elasticsearch indexing enabled or not. OK, awesome. So you kick off Brabeat, so there's this option in your config file. You tell it whether you want Elasticsearch indexing enabled or not. And if it's enabled, it kicks off, Brabeat kicks off Ansible. Ansible goes into each of your overcloud nodes. It grabs the config data. It grabs data about how your open stack is configured, how many workers of Nova are there, how many Nova scheduler workers are there. And as such, it also grabs data about your hardware, about what kernel you're running and whatnot. And it outputs them as different JSONs, one for your environment, one for your software, one for your hardware. So there's different JSONs sitting in there. And once your benchmark run completes, Brabeat also massages your result JSON so that it's in a form that gets you the most value out of Elasticsearch. And it combines this, this metadata with the data and ships it over to Elasticsearch using the Elasticsearch connector we provide. And the end user can look at Kibana and query and get his visualizations. So all of this happens on the, under the hood. The only thing you'd have to change is enable Elasticsearch in your config file and also of course, you need to have an Elasticsearch instance, and you can spin it up quite easily using our Ansible playbooks. OK, so metadata. Why is metadata important? We're talking a lot about metadata and that we uh, capture metadata about the cloud, but what makes it so important? So if I give you a spreadsheet or a document with a bunch of great numbers, great results, what can you make out of it? Unless you know anything about the environment, anything specific to the environment, that's not going to make any sense, right? The numbers are great. But to have some value from the numbers, you need to know what the setup was like. So metadata actually adds more value to your data. So it captures configuration details. And it also captures how the test was set up. Like in the case of Shaker, it's already in the JSON, but we ship it in a format that's easily queryable by Elasticsearch. So how many VMs were running, 
in the case of Rally, what, what the concurrency was. And what this ultimately enables you to do is, when you have your cloud, you run some performance benchmarks, all of this is shipped to Elasticsearch, and then you tune your cloud with a new worker account or something like that, and you run your performance benchmarks, and simply you'll be able to query Elasticsearch based on, say, let's say, the query term we have here is OpenStack underscore Neutron underscore API underscore workers. That, that is 32. So I only want to see results when the Neutron API workers were set to 32. So I'll be able to do things like this with metadata being shipped along with result data. OK, so metadata to the rescue. This slide is more of a screen scrape from Rally and a screen scrape from Kibana. Uh, the browbeat scenario we were running was a Rally one, where we were trying to create and list routers. And the thing that, uh, that was different here was uh, there were two runs of Rally, but each of them had a different count of Neutron API workers. One had 24 on a 24 core machine, and the other had 48 on a 40, 48 core machine. So each of these colors represents a different worker count. But if I just looked at the Rally uh, report, how would I be able to know what the worker count was when I actually ran the test? Unless I make a note of it somewhere, or unless I name my Rally result file to reflect the worker count. So how am I ever going to know what the number of workers was? So this is what metadata helps us do. So it helps us query results based on the actual test environment. Did you got to do something? OK, so bringing data to life using Kibana. So what you see here is uh, Keystone performance, so going along the same line, Keystone performance benchmarks. But the only thing that's, uh, that you can see here is that we're doing performance benchmarking with one thread and six threads, and how is it going to compare? So with Kibana, I was able to plot the concurrency of the rally scenario on the x-axis and the response time on the y-axis, lower being better because it's response time. And also, because I have the metadata about the number of threads, I was easily able to slice and dice data and split bars based on the worker count, uh, the thread count. So let's jump into the next slide, and we can see uh, you know, the kind of power Kibana gives us. Uh, OK, so the next slide is about the same benchmarks. But what if you switch to your keystone token type from UID to for an A? So you'll be able to split charts based on that. We've spent so much time on the tool that we've had to make severe compromises in our uh, presentation integrity. So it's a worthy sacrifice, though. Okay. Uh, I don't know, I mean, all these slides have his pictures, so. I can't click it because it's. Can you help us? Okay, so what I was going to show the next slides was how I visualized network performance data using Shaker and how I was able to, you know, separate out DVR runs from. Legacy runs. So DVR is distributed virtual router uh, routing. So you have your router sitting on your compute node, whereas in the legacy case, it's just on the controller nodes. Uh, awesome. So this was the next Keystone chart I was going to talk about. So the chart you see below is with the Keystone token type set to Fernay, and the chart you see above is with the Keystone token type set to U UID. So you can basically uh, split charts also based on your metadata. So these are some, some of the shaker visualizations because the shaker data is in Elasticsearch now. I can also separate results based on whether they were DVR or legacy. You can see this particular case is DVR east-west with both instances on the same compute node. So pretty much your traffic never leaves your compute node. So you see much, much higher throughput in the case of DVR. So you can also do line charts, and you can see the query I put in there exactly. So that's how I uh, pull up these results. So what was, the, what was the number of VMs? What was the concurrency? Was it a bi bidirectional test? Was it TCP download, or, or was it TCP upload? So and the best part about it, you don't have to build most of these dash dashboards. You just run this simple Ansible playbook, and it sets up the dashboards for you. So once you have Elasticsearch indexing enabled, Automatically, Robity is going to keep pushing data to Elasticsearch. And since you have the da uh, Kibana dashboards installed, you can pretty much relax and look at your results. 
So this is one more slide about aggregating results. Going back to the same 96 sets of uh, Keystone benchmarks, where each of them was run with a different concurrency and as such. So if I had 96 different rally reports, not good, right? But what if I had a single dashboard that we already shipped to you, and you can just pull it up and see how Keystone was performing all along this benchmarking process. So this is the cool thing about this. So, so we have this cool tool. So you might be curious, you know, what are the different issues we run into it, uh, trying to find out with it, what are the different scale issues we found. So let's just go over it. So DVR with floating IPs, so the browbeat scenario we used here was simply boot a VM on a subnet and try to ping it with a floating IP. So obviously, if you see the red arrow there, uh, that was the time taken for the VM to be pingable after it was in active state. So the dark color you see there, that's legacy routers. There's no bar corresponding to that on its left side. So that means that it was so small in the case of legacy that you can't even see it on the scale of this graph. But in the case of DVR, it was taking much longer to, for the VM to be pingable. So we just dig deeper into it, and it turned out to be a kernel issue. So these are things you can find out. And there's obviously value in looking at individual rally uh, charts, where you can see the particular iterations that took. So you can see that it was not always happening, but it was happening only on a few instances. You can obviously do that with Kibana too, but you'd have to do a different query based on that. So metadata proxy memory growth, this was the other thing we, we hid. So creating and listing routers using rally 1,500 times. So you, you can see how the metadata proxy grows in memory. So this was the other issue. I'm just going to go on high level here in the best interest of time. So sometimes, or most times, people use their OpenStack cloud with the defaults. So what if we were shipping bad defaults? So this was one issue we hit. So with Newton, the way uh, Triple O treated the default configuration in the configuration file, it changed. So it was not defaulting to the number of cores. It was actually defaulting to a single worker. So these are issues we could find out running Browbeat because we have the metadata about the cloud. We knew how many workers were there. And we could easily figure out, you know, we were configuring bad defaults. And these are not defaults that we should be shipping with. And this issue was resolved after that. So heat engine memory usage. So I just like to point out that we also monitored the undercloud. So once you have our playbooks, once you run our playbooks and you have Grafana, Graphite, everything set up, you can actually monitor your undercloud while you're deploying. So you can see that you know, how the heat engine memory usage is growing when you're scaling up your computes from 30 to 60 to 90 and as such. I'll hand it over to Alex now. OK, so I'll talk about Keystone and token performance. Um, there's obviously, if you've worked with Keystone, there's many ways to, uh, many major options that are be performance impacting your deployment model. Um, if you're an Apache, your process versus your thread count that you can set up for the WSGI daemons, uh, your token type. So the scenario that I ran here with Browbeat was to quickly represent um, a change in the uh, process and thread count there. So uh, this is the Browbeat scenario file that I have there, the YAML. And I ran through four different concurrencies on Rally. And I ran it 1,000 times. And here is the results. Did an update. OK. Um, so this is the Kibana results here. Uh, you, you could basically see that top left would be for measuring the number of, uh, I'll just do a count of how many results I have for each concurrency. So I want to see a flat. I, I know that I'm comparing to, you know, one result with 24 processes and one result with one process. And then the lower graphs um, are the response times itself. So lower is better there. And you can obviously see that the, the red one is one process. and uh, the bluer color is 24 process. So the more process you have, the, the better the response time is going to be. And we want to look at the minimum, because you can see at certain times that 24 processes might not perform as well as a single process in certain situations. But then when you look at the maximum, as well as the 50th and 95th and 99th percentiles, you might, you'll see different uh, attributes there. So the other big thing is we obviously want to check the system performance as well. So the first thing I'll do is I'll make sure that when I tuned Keystone, that it did what I, what I wanted it to do. So I'll look at the number of processes that are running there. Um, and you can see it's 1, and then it's 24. Um, and then below that, you can see when I ran the Keystone benchmarks, I was pegging out that single process. 
Um, and then after I tuned it, you can see that it got access to more CPU. Of course, more CPU is going to cost something. It's going to cost us more memory. So we want to look down just a little bit further at the amount of memory. So another situation that we've run into that we started testing with Browbeat is just on the telemetry side. So what I've done there is I'll set the polling interval down to 60 seconds, and then I'll boot 20 instances, and I'll sleep for 20 minutes, and then I'll have that repeat until there's 200 instances. Then I'll just analyze the system performance. I was really interested in looking at Noki, but we don't quite have Noki benchmarks yet that are out there that we're, that we're utilizing. Um, you can see when zero instances was booted all the way up until we had 200. You can see the CPU there is pretty well, well, pretty well saturated. So at that point, we consulted with some telemetry guys and looked through the configuration. We found a way to tone, that, tone back um, the amount of time it was pro for processing, the delay in between processing the actual metrics itself. So we toned that back to 60, and you can see the giant relief in system performance there. So Browbeat Future. Um, the biggest thing that we really want to go for with, with the future of Browbeat is to kind of mix and match the workloads. So I want to be able to maybe boot 20 instances onto my cloud, then run some perfkit benchmarks, and boot 20 more. So we kind of want to have a, a bigger mix and match of the workloads, because right now it's very static, where I'll run like Rally, then I'll run perfkit, then I'll run Shaker. We also want to be able to create workloads such as like running Ansible, where we can, we can uh, tap into our Ansible playbooks to adjust the cloud, make some changes, rerun those same benchmarks, help us with the automation factor there, and seeing what, what tunings look like uh, in, our, in our results graphs as well as in our system metrics graphs. Contributing to Browbeat. So you can find us at browbeatproject.org. You can find us on Freenode. Um, and we're part of the Big, uh, big Tent uh, part of OpenStack, so we are, we're on our GitHub. We have a gear and Launchpad. All right, questions and answers. I think we got three minutes. And if, uh, if you have a question, try to use one of the mics as well, please, so we can, we can hear it. So what kind of <laughs> Nothing. Nothing works in this room, so bear with us. Uh, what kind of environment do you need to have to run Browbeat? Like, can I run it in a VM? Uh, you can, but taking any sort of, like, performance metrics and measurements out of a VM is going to be pretty difficult to get accurate numbers. I do mean, you recommend bare metal? I'd recommend bare metal. We can, uh, if I can get that one slide to show that couldn't before, it might help you out. If anyone has a small animal we can sacrifice to give us better luck on the presentation. I have a cat, but I left them at home. Okay. <laughs> this is generally what we recommend. Well, uh, a piece of bare metal for your elastic search, uh, a piece of bare metal for your graphite carbon. And then I'd recommend bare metal for your controllers and bare metal for your computes, obviously. Um, if you're under cloud, I would do that bare metal as well. I've done that in the past as a VM. But to run Browbeat, if you're just doing control plane, if you're doing just benchmarks against the overcloud, then it's fine to keep your undercloud virtualized. But you want to look at the system metrics as well, see if there's any contention that you're running there. If you're running out of CPU just from running the benchmarks there, Obviously, you're not going to be able to drive the system with a hard enough load. And uh, one more question real quick. Is are, are you integrated with DCI yet? DCI? That's Red Hat's oh. CI. Um, th there is some components that have been integrated with the CI. I'm, I'm not the expert on that, that side, though. Sure. Thank you. So there's a lot of language throughout this presentation and throughout your code about under cloud, over cloud. Is it possible, and how difficult is it to run it without triple L? So to run it without triple O, you just have to generate, pretty much generate your own host file. And there's probably a little bit of configuration you might have to do on some of the workload providers, such as maybe a perfkit. If you don't have like an over cloud RC, you'd have to name your RC file over cloud RC or edit. We can edit the code. Uh, we'd love for up, you know, other developers to help us build that functionality for other installers. So. Yeah, at the end of the day, you're still talking to APIs, too. So it, it's not that much different. Looks like we're out of time, so thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.